Hi everyone, welcome to the British Library. Um, I'm Tanya Kirk, I'm the lead curator for Fantasy Realms of the Imagination. It's all very surreal today because we've been working on this for over four years and it opened today and I can't actually believe that it's a real thing. <laughs> Um, thanks, that was nice. <laughs> uh, fantasy's never been more popular or vibrant or ubiquitous than today, and I'm really proud that the library's chosen to showcase it this year. Um, although it's everywhere, a lot of people don't maybe realise that its roots come from really old forms of storytelling, like fairy tale, folk tale, an ancient epic, and that's something that the library is able to show really well with our collections. Um, and I really hope that people learn more about the histories behind fantasy when they come to the exhibition. It's exploded from the page, though, today, and it's taken on forms all across the media. So in the exhibition, we showcase not only books and manuscripts, but also um, film and TV, costumes, props, uh, artworks, uh, music, and I've probably forgotten some things, but many other things. <laughs> Uh, we have many British Library treasures on display, so you can see, for example, the original manuscript for Alice's Adventures Underground, which would become Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. Um, you can see really early manuscripts like uh, the uh, manuscript of Beowulf and Sir Grain in the Green Knight, all in the exhibition. But we also have really amazing loans. Um, we've been working with not, uh, not only institutions, but also um, fantasy creatives all over the world and I'm really excited that we've got for example um, some of the manuscripts from Wizard of Earthsea by Ursula K. Le Guin which have never been in the UK before um, and <laughs> uh, and um, also Neil Gaiman has very kindly lent us his notebook for his novel Coraline which is also in the exhibition alongside the Alice manuscript so there's some really really special things um, and one thing that I have really loved working on this exhibition is what an amazing community fantasy is. And I obviously get that sense tonight, but um, also just in the gallery, it's just such a lovely atmosphere and it's just been a joy to work on it. So it's on till 25th of February. And if you've not been already, and even if you have been already, come again. <laughs> um, and uh, thank you ever so much for coming tonight. I hope you enjoy the rest of the evening. I'm going to hand on to John to... Uh, introduce our guests. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. I just want to welcome everybody watching this event online, uh, wherever you are in the world. Um, around the UK, we have the Living Knowledge Network Library Partners who are also doing special screenings tonight. So greetings to everybody who's, who's joining us online. If you want to ask a question during the latter part of the conversation, that's great in the room you obviously can put your hand up those watching online there's a form below the screen also those watching online if you do want to order any books by tonight's speakers there's a tab at the top of the screen you can do that so uh, I'd love to introduce now to the stage obviously the incredible Susan Cooper together with the equally amazing and wonderful Natalie Haynes who you will know as a broadcaster and a fantastic writer specialising in uh, uh, reworkings of classical myths such as uh, Stone Blind and Divine Might which are also outside but now Please welcome to the stage, Natalie Haynes and Susan Cooper. And they showed us the exhibition earlier today, and it's fantastic. It's just wonderful. It actually is fantastic, although I don't think we're going to tonight beat the sound of people gasping with joy <laughs> at there being a notebook of Ursula K. Le Guin <laughs> in a building near the building you're currently sitting in. I was like, yeah, you're our people, hello. <laughs> um, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me an indescribable pleasure uh, to introduce Susan Cooper. Uh, she was born and grew up in the UK. She studied at Oxford before becoming a reporter for the Sunday Times. At the age of 25, she began writing a book about three children taking a train to Cornwall. Five books later, she was the winner of the Newbury Medal, a Newbury Honour Award, and two Carnegie Honour Awards. More recently, she has been given the Hans Christian Andersen Award, 
the Margaret A. Edwards Award and the World Fantasy Award for Lifetime Achievement, which I might add, she got a decade ago. Uh, <clears throat> <laughs> they thought I'd had it, yeah. <laughs> Proving them wrong again. This year, The Dark is Rising, which I know you probably love, at least, you know, almost as much as I do, um, <laughs> celebrates its 50th birthday. Please join me in welcoming Susan Cooper. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> so you began writing this series of books um, without knowing that they would be fantasy novels. In fact, without knowing that it would be a series, when you wrote Oversea Under Stone, um, it was you discovered it yeah. as you went. And that train journey didn't even make the final book. What happened? It was, uh, um, I, was on the, I was a reporter on the Sunday Times, and uh, they had a feature called Mainly for Children, which um, I did a couple of things for, just for fun. And one day, the literary editor of the the newspaper came in with a piece of paper, and he said, you ought to try this. And it was a um, competition for a family adventure story um, from the publishers of, I forget which, it was Ernest Benn, anyway. Um, and they were offering a 1,000 pounds as a prize, which was more than I earned in a year. <laughs> So I thought, OK, I'll try it. <laughs> and I started to write a story about three children going to Cornwall for a holiday, as my brother and I had often done. Um, and I got them. There was the chapter about the train journey. And then they get to Cornwall, and they are met, said my imagination, by a great uncle called Merriman Lyon. I didn't even know he was Merriman Lyon then. He was just called Great Uncle Mary. And from that point on, writing it, it became a fantasy. Um, and so it wasn't eligible for the prize. <laughs> um, and it, it, I did get published by Jonathan Cape instead. Um, but I had no idea it would ever have a sequel. It's sort of open-ended at the end. It is. Yeah. Yeah. We probably both leave books open-ended now and again. Just yes. To, yeah. Just on the off chance. Yeah. <laughs> Shall I go on to the rest of the series? I mean, because then there was a gap, right? Then you. Yeah, there's a huge gap. I, I went. Um, then my newspaper sent me to America. I ended up marrying an American, going to live there. That wasn't for the newspaper. That was. <laughs> um, I had three stepchildren, I had two babies, I wrote two adult books, and then one day um, my husband and I were cross-country skiing in Massachusetts, and I saw branches sticking up out of the snow, looking like, a bit like buried antlers, and I thought... I want to write a book about a boy who wakes up on his birthday um, and finds he can work magic in snow, just like this, but in England. And I tried to write this book. It didn't work. Um, more years went by. And then one day, for some reason, I reread Oversea Under Stone. And suddenly thought, this, this book about the boy links with that, and began thinking um, about the story, about where it might go, and suddenly feeling that, no, there's not going to be one more book. There are going to be four more books. And I wrote down the titles, which mostly stayed the same. I wrote down who was going to be in each book, where they were going to be set. Um, and I wrote the last half page of the last book. <laughs> um, and 
the next six years, I wrote all those books. And we still had, there was an exhibition in, at the Bodleian in Oxford uh, a few years ago. And we had the, the piece of paper on which I wrote all those titles. And we had the page with the, the last half page. Um, so that, that was the gap. <laughs> uh, this is an acceptable gap. <laughs> it all worked out. So this raises two questions for me. Um, the first is that you described this as a, a truly astonishing day when you wrote the outline of all the books and found all the characters. Did you know as you did it that your life was going to change? Or were you just excited to tell the stories? Oh, I was just excited to tell the stories. Yeah. 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 Okay, my second question is this. So the snow came first. The very first thing that you had for Dark is Rising was the snow that you were moving through. And that came before any other element of it. Yep. Thank you, Snow. Yeah. <laughs> I think we can all say thank you, Snow, at this moment. Because I find this a really interesting part of um, The Dark is Rising in particular, but of your books in general, is that I think it's so grounded in its setting in Buckinghamshire, and yet you wrote it from Massachusetts when you were homesick. It was all out of homesickness. For the, I mean, I was very homesick anyway. Um, so I was living back at home while I was writing the books, uh, which was wonderful. I mean, J.B. Priestley, I, I, it sounds like I've been stalking you, but I have, of course, just been reading your essays. J.B. Priestley told you that you would find you'd write much better about a place when you were away from it. And I wonder if this is why Will Stanton's world is so real to all of us, because you're creating it not for your readers, actually, first and foremost, but for yourself. Yes, and I think most um, authors publish for children write for themselves. Um, I did a radio programme with Maurice Sendak once, and we both said exactly the same thing. Um, I don't write for children, I write for me. Um, but it, it was the homesickness um, driving me through those books, um, which is perhaps why the, the link to place is, is so close. Um, it's, it, Alan Garner and I are like in this. I mean, he still lives in his, his place, which is Cheshire. Uh, and mine was uh, in my head, remembering. Um, but the essence of the books is place. Yes. Yeah. And I have this theory, which might be wrong, but um, I think we have our best ideas, generally, as people, but particularly as writers, when our bodies are doing something that's hard but not too hard, so our minds can run free. Is cross-country skiing <laughs> <laughs> the right thing to do? Because I don't live somewhere that cold. No. I have to go for a run for this. You're time. asking the wrong person. I'm a terrible skier. <laughs> I mean, it, it worked out, though. <laughs> oh, I'm grateful to it. Yeah. <laughs> so, Hunter Coombe in Dark is Rising, the place is fictional, but it's also real. It's real. Well, Hunter Coombe Lane is, a, is an actual road. Yeah. Halfway between Slough and Maidenhead. And um, Dorney is the place. And Dorney is, is a village. The, the church is still there in Jor Dorney. Hantiku yeah. Manor is still there. Though it's no longer a manor, it's, it's, it's some sort of institution, I think. Um, but of course, the, the, the fields and the whole area of my childhood is, is now covered in concrete um, and motorway. So I can't go find it. No. And you, you took a real farmer and made and borrowed his farm. Because you were... Yes. This feels like it farm. can't be true. You were yeah. a teenage raspberry picker. That farm was there. In Buckinghamshire. <laughs> <laughs> Which, oddly, isn't the title of your autobiography. I find it <laughs> fully <Not> baffling. <laughs> <laughs> the night's young. Um, I think this is a really interesting point about Dark is Rising in particular, though, because you've said that critics call it high fantasy or have called it high fantasy. But I think the specific magic of The Dark is Rising is the fact that its fantasy elements occupy the same time and space as the real world. It just somehow exists above them. Sometimes it sort of shimmers over them, you know, so, so you can see it. I think that's what makes it so magical, that combination. I think that combination is in, again in Alan Garner and in Philip Pullman too, that uh, we all write about the real world with time and 
magic, for want of a better word, coming into it. We don't make... Uh, American fantasy writers, like Ursula, mostly uh, invent whole new worlds, mm. I think. Um, British writers, certainly us three, um, use the real world. Because anything can happen to any one of you in that case. <laughs> But um, I find myself wondering, since you were taught at Oxford by Tolkien and C.S. Lewis, <laughs> do you think they might have set you on a path? <laughs> to becoming they did. A they, they certainly they set anybody who read English at Oxford in the 1950s was certainly set on a path by those two, not because of what they wrote, but because... Um, Tolkien in particular had control of the English syllabus <laughs> uh, and it stopped at 1832 <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't study the Victorians we didn't study anybody modern um, it was Beowulf, Gawain uh, Mallory you know, everything Chaucer. medieval yeah. Chaucer of course yeah. um, but that made a huge difference I think um, because it focused us on folktale, myth um, yeah. And I hadn't, I'm not a fan of Narnia. I hadn't read, oh, I don't think he'd written them then. Um, Tolkien, we knew his books. He was about to write the third one. Uh, but I don't think they influenced me, particularly me, because oh, what, what do I know? I just know about me um, as a writer. But that influence on the teaching was huge. So were you interested in that category of literature the, the before we were you learning. got there? Or, yes, or, yes, yes, that's true. Because I was a child of World War II um, when they were publishing a quarter of the usual books yep. that were published for children. So, And also, um, you didn't go to bookshops. You didn't, it was a... a that war focused you on what's well, any war, focused you on what was at home, and so I read folk tale. Fairy. My parents had a twenty-volume set of Dickens, so I used to pick out the bits I could understand. But otherwise, it was early stuff. Yeah. Oh, this explains. I've always wondered in that bit in Silver on the Tree, where Simon apologises for using the abbreviation APs, and Bron corrects him and says, "We read Dickens here too in Wales." <laughs> so it turns out that was secretly you. <laughs> But, I mean, this is a really important part of your storytelling is myth and folklore from the whole of the UK, actually. King Arthur, of course, but Herne the Hunter, the Mary Cloyd. Um, so English, Welsh, Cornish, myth are all yeah. in your stories. Why are these... Um, why is this folklore? Why are these particular stories so important, so elemental? Because I'm English, because, because I focus. What put you into Greek? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's the best and worst answer. I had a really brilliant teacher. And the nice thing about it, actually, is that I don't think he particularly liked me, which was fair enough, because I was really annoying. Um, <laughs> but it at no point changed what a good teacher he was. He was just brilliant. He was funny. He was deadpan. And we were pretty irritating, I would imagine. But there was the thrill of a different alphabet, which felt like a secret code. And then, I mean, the thing with learning French, which I had to do at the same time, is that you learn to say, you know, please could you tell me the way to the customs house? And then you do Greek, and you learn to say, sing goddess of the rage of Achilles. <laughs> and you're like, yeah, yeah, this, these are the guys, excuse me, these guys are for me, thanks, yeah. So that's why. But you didn't have any wrath of Achilles. <laughs> so I don't know what you were thinking. <laughs> but, the, I mean, folk songs are a big part, actually, um, which I suppose is closer, isn't it, to uh, Homer in some ways. So things like the hunting of the wren make a really important thematic threat yes. to Darkest it's, Rising. I'm just obsessed with my native country. <laughs> I love this. Um, I wondered if we could talk a little bit about your idea of the dark and the light, your um, way of considering 
good and evil being locked in this unending war. It began, you said, when you were a child during World War II. It ha World War II had, had an enormous effect because when, I mean, I was 10 when it ended, so I was, what, four when it began. Mm. Um, and so the, the formative things are being, there was a, uh, an anti, I've, that there's an anti-aircraft post at the end of our road um, because the main railway line to the west ran from London past uh, just about there, and the Germans were always trying to hit it. So an awful lot of nights uh, were spent when the air raid, air raid siren goes and your parents pull you out of bed and take you down to the air raid shelter, which everybody's dad had had built in the first year of the war underneath the back lawn. Um, and we would sit there, uh, my brother and I, with my mother reading to us by candlelight. And the candle flame would shake every time a bomb fell. And it would get closer and closer. Things like that. And the fact that what we collected as kids was bits of shrapnel from wherever the bombs had fallen the night before. Uh, and if you grow up like that, at that young, that early an age, um, then you have this constant image of us and them, of the dark and the light, and the dark in particular because they, they always came at night. Um, and that doesn't go away. So that's probably why I ended up writing about the dark and the light. Yes, but there's, um, you don't approach it in a remotely dewy-eyed way, if you don't mind me saying so. There's a, a really beautiful moment later in the series, I don't want to spoil it in case everyone hasn't read <laughs> right through to the end, where Will acknowledges that the light has this kind of cold oh, yes. coldness at its centre yeah. too, that yeah. in order to fight, yeah. you have to be willing to, to sacrifice. Yeah. And I wondered if that had also developed as a feeling when you were a child. That I don't know. I, not consciously, certainly, I don't think. Well, no, that's not true, because that's what happens when the bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. That was the light behaving like the dark in order to win. And there's something I had Miriam say, which says, where is it? I'm not sure I can read it without my specs. Do you want to borrow mine? <laughs> the, <laughs> they might not help. The struggle between good and evil goes on around us all the time, like two armies fighting. And sometimes one of them will seem to be winning, and sometimes the other but neither has ever triumphed altogether, nor ever will, for there is something of each in every man. That's what the books say, I think, mm -hmm. if they say anything um, about the dark and the light. They will always be with us because they are inside us. Um, and he says something better towards the end of the sequence, which I can't quote because I couldn't find it. <laughs> um, <laughs> when he more or less says it is up to you, he says to the children, that the hope for a good world depends on what you do. Um, which, again, because there is the mixture in each one of us. There is no happy ending. There is no you catastrophe. But you can make things better. There's moral complexity running throughout yeah. the book. And yeah. I, I think, in a way, I wonder if it's at least in part because Will is from a big family, that he's the youngest of nine. I was trying to think of other examples of narratives where someone realises they have magic powers at a certain point in their childhood where they are part of a big and happy family because normally they're an orphan. Or, it's true. You know, yeah. at least one parent yeah. is missing. Essentially, we give the child the freedom to go and explore their magic. But Will has that freedom because of the ability to pause time that um, both the light and the dark have. But actually, there is something incredibly poignant about 
the fact that when he discovers his powers, which should be a wonderful moment and is, he loses something. Yes, he becomes lonely because he's different. And he's never been different. No. Poor boy. I know. But I, I mean, I think it's rare to have that big family. Is that because you were writing haven't, with your own big family? I haven't thought about that. No, I haven't got a big family. I've just got one brother. I mean, you literally had three <laughs> teenage stepchildren and two babies. That's quite a big family. I've only got one brother. <laughs> That's massive. I didn't grow up with them. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I mean, it, I find it an incredibly beautiful moment. Um, is, in fact, we heard the, the sequence around that uh, earlier when the skylight falls in um, near the start, I'm not spoiling it, near the start of Dark is Rising and Paul comes up to help him, to help Will and to fix the skylight and he says, you know, go and sleep in my bed. And this, it's such a beautiful moment. There's, there's, it's, it's quite unusual for your narrative voice to almost step in. Normally it's, it's quite quiet, but... Um, you wrote on page eight, in case anyone's checking their copy, about Will. He knew he could not stay alone in the room where he belonged. I, it is entirely worth that noise. Correct. <laughs> Correct, British Library. It's one of the most beautiful sentences I think anyone's ever written about Good heavens. what it means to be a child who suddenly realises they don't fit in their family quite anymore. Yeah, yeah, true. So there. You can yeah. say good heavens if you want. But <laughs> I'm not even slightly I didn't taking know. it back. <laughs> Um, I wondered if we could talk a little bit about the rules that govern magic in your world and the world of The Dark is Rising. You're really specific about the places that are exempt from magic, so running water can't hold it, for example. Time travellers um, are always both in their own time and in the time they've travelled to. Um, does fantasy need rules for its stories to work? I think it does. I think you have to know what they are yourself. I could not possibly recite to you the rules of, <laughs> behind these five books. Um, I do know that when um, a perfectly terrible film was made from The Darkest Rising... <laughs> <laughs> I had written to the uh, director and, and <laughs> producers saying um, there are certain rules <laughs> about, about the, the, the magic in this book that, that you should remember. Yes. And they just forgot the whole thing. They, they broke all the rules. Um, I'm amazed they read the book, frankly. It didn't look and, like uh, <laughs> I judge from the trailer alone. Yes, well, we, we'll forget that. Yeah. Yes. I, I wasn't going to bring it up. But I've got a friend who, when um, they want to make me cover my ears and cry in sadness, will say, and I feel bad even saying it out loud, but I'm just going to, will say in an American accent, Will was just an ordinary boy, which is how that trailer begins. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> and I'm like that. <laughs> you can distract me from any problem merely by doing that. If you want to do it in a positive way, offer me a piece of toffee. In a negative way, that will work. Oh, dear. Bonus fact for you all. Um, <laughs> I have to tell you the thing that Philip Foreman said to me in a letter. Um, I was writing to him about uh, the fact that I'd had this bad film make, made, asking him what his experience had been. <laughs> and the, the, uh, in the end of the letter, he said, I hope I can get this right, um, what can we do? We, can, we really can't do anything in the long run. We can just hope that the... Person, Kate, tell me if I'm getting this wrong. Um, the person to whom you entrust your precious Ming vase is not an orangutan. <laughs> <laughs> we got the orangutan. <laughs> Philip didn't. <laughs> I mean, orangutans are good at other things, so in, <laughs> in fairness, I think that slightly undersells them, but... Um, we cannot possibly talk about The Darkest Rising without discussing Merriman Lyon, one of the great enigmatic forces for good in fiction. Um, his appearance is such an important part of him, his hawk nose, his shock of white hair. Um, I wondered if he was based on a real person. I steal faces for my characters, but only strangers. I never pick anyone I know. Um, I don't think he's based on anybody. Um, it's just the way he... 
turned up. Turned up, yeah. yeah but they, that's where they, they do turn up, don't they? Oh, they Just, do. Yes, and then you, you think, oh, well, this is how the character looks, okay. Yeah, and, and elbow themselves into a bit of the story where you, and you're like, yeah. well, all right, yeah, no, this yeah. seems to be working. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And oh, halfway yeah. through a story, you can be, you, you think you know where you're going, and then there's somebody who turns up, yes? Yes. And it's extraordinary. Well, you just have to make space. We're lucky. You? Yeah, we are. God, yeah. No, we really are. I wondered what you read when you were a child, aside from Dickens and, <laughs> uh, and Chaucer. You mentioned Arthur Ransom. So that idea of children going on an adventure, you know, without adults quite so close behind them, I that's very present in Overseas um, Stone, perhaps. Yeah, it's funny that the, 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 the one set of books I had was Arthur Ransom, who is firmly realistic. Um, uh, I think it's partly because that was what was being published then. Um, I don't... It's very hard for me to put my finger on anything that I read when I was a kid and say, oh, yes, obviously, that's, that influenced me to write fantasy. Um, except for the fact that there were all these folk tales and fairy stories because there was nothing else to read. Um, Not a very good answer. It's an <laughs> excellent answer, as they all are. Um, I love the fact that we get a sense um, at kind of crucial moments in Will's awakening as an old one and also in his quest throughout the books that the old ones are around the whole world thinking about him and sending him messages and sometimes objects. I wondered if you had ever been tempted to do a spin-off? <laughs> You know, maybe in Massachusetts or something, just somewhere you might know <laughs> where we could see how the other old ones were getting on. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, from time to time, I've, I've tried to see if I could think of a story that would bring Will back, uh, but I've never, it's never happened. I don't think, it's not meant. <laughs> he's busy. He's, he's, he's busy, he's done enough. <laughs> you know, he saved the world. Busy boy. Right. <laughs> um, Merriman is one of the most um, opaque characters that we find. I mean, I think it's fair to say that there have been many authority figure, kind of grandfatherly, great uncle-ish. Oh Lord, yes. Um, figures who have who owe a huge debt to him. I think. Oh, yeah, really? yeah. <clears throat> Dumbledore. Um, <laughs> And I wondered if you had... <laughs> I wondered if it was, this was a, a kind of figure that you had in your life when you were a child, this kind of strange and enigmatic uncle or teacher or parent who would suddenly appear and disappear at will. I think um, Merriman knows, owes more than I ever realised before to my grandfather, my mother's father. Um, who was that sort of authority figure um, who came to stay with us once when I was 12 and took me to the cinema, I didn't, which, which rarely happened, uh, to see a, a film that was called in uh, Britain, A Matter of Life and Death, um, The Archers. Um, and that had a huge influence. That was a fantasy. Yes. Um, it's a beautiful film. And Grandad was an enigmatic fella. Um, I just think he was lurking at the back of my imagination, mm. probably. But it's not a model. I mean, he didn't look like that. He's, he's, uh, there is a point in... Um, oversee under stone when Barney, the youngest, realises that Great Uncle Mary's name is Merriman and he's Merriman Lion. And he says something like Merriman Lion, Merlion, Merlin. And it was at that moment that my head was saying that. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you've been doing. You, know? you didn't know up till then? 
wow, this guy's name is really unusual. <laughs> I was thinking this when um, the rider appears disguised as uh, a sort of innocent jewellery customer, and his name is Mitterthin. Mitterthin. Where, yes. on, where on earth is I that can't from? remember. I googled it. It's the only <laughs> example of it anywhere online. It's just yours. I thought it must have a secret message in it. I'd have to look in my notebooks. <laughs> Are they at the Bodleian? Have I got to wait? No. <laughs> They're in Toronto. <laughs> mm. um, this brings me to um, a question that I think we probably all really need to know the answer to, which is that sacred and magical objects, the six signs, of course, in The Darkest Rising um, and the grail for the Drew children, they are protective, they are talismanic, they are powerful, they're deeply desirable, everybody wants them, but also they're described in a way which makes them as objects seem deeply desirable. It's perfectly plausible that somebody would break into the British Museum to steal uh, the grail, for example, as happens at the beginning of Greenwich. The, the six signs are so beautifully described. Um, I wondered if you knew how they would all look when you started the book and where they would all be found and how they would all be found or if you discovered that on the way. Found them, found out as I went along. I didn't have any idea, I don't think where each sign would be found, or even what they were, mm. I think, until I was writing the book. But this is what we do, isn't it? I mean, you, don't you... I know you're using real characters yes. from, from Greek myth, but then you take off and they're... You find out things about them. Absolutely do. Yeah, because the only information you've got is a vase painting. Yeah. And so <laughs> yeah. I'd better fill in go. some narrative. <laughs> <laughs> Then this brings me to the question that I feel we really all need to know the answer to, which is, which of the six signs would you most like to own? <laughs> I can't answer that question. <laughs> you know, I always think it's the sign of fire for me, and then when I reread it, every time I'm like, yeah, sign of fire, and then the last minute I go, no, it's water. I think it probably would be water. Aha! <laughs> <laughs> I love that we get the renewal of the sign of wood, too, that it feels like such an important part of the story that renewal happens, yeah. that the cold and the yeah. dark come and then the light and the warmth can only come afterwards. Yeah. It feels like, in a way, that's the most important metaphorical sign. It probably is, yeah. It's more complicated than the others. It is. Because it's live. The others are not. Yeah. But you're very alert Water to the different alive. qualities of wood and things like that when you write about this you know the children are like well you could use oak though because that's you know there are really ancient things of oak and it's like no it has to be this kind of wood <laughs> that needs renewing i, yes, I find it well, really pleasing what i have one of the things i have in common with rob mcfarlane is this thing about trees <laughs> he is mad about trees yeah. <laughs> obsessed <laughs> fully obsessed um I think that sense of renewal is something that I, I wanted to ask you. And then I'm going to ask Simon and Rob to join us on stage and talk to us a little bit about adapting Dark is Rising and their experiences with this book. Um, but I, I wondered if that sense of renewal, it seems in a way almost at odds with the idea that neither the dark or the light can ever win. It, we've only ever got them rising and falling. But there's also this cyclical process, the changing of the year. And the books actually take place across quite a short time. Um, we're in the summer when the uh, Drew children are in Cornwall, and then it's midwinter for Dark is Rising. But we're only a few months later in April for, um, in, uh, yeah, April for Greenwich, right? And then October yep. for uh, Grey King. So yep. it's actually a really, it's a relatively short span of time. But we do get the sense of the seasons passing, and that, it seemed to me, was an important part of the narrative. Just because it's an important part of life, I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, the books... Um, I think those books are basically about time. Um, an examination of time and how little we understand it. Um, time for us on Earth is renewal. It's the cycle. Um, Whereas if you start thinking about the time-space continuum, it gets extremely complicated, and we don't know anything about it. Um, 
That is a very incomplete answer. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it was making me think of the moment where the dark is outside the church, um, screaming outside, and the vicar kind of bravely appeals to faith. And the old ones are just like, I mean, if you want vicar. <laughs> you know, that, that makes you feel better, yeah, sure. But they're really conscious of the fact. And then Will realises he has to just stop him from thinking. Yeah. yeah. Which yeah. he does. Yeah. Well, saves time. <laughs> if you'll forgive the pun. Um, speaking of which, can I therefore ask you, Rob and Simon, to come and join us? Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome Simon McBurney and Rob McFarlane. <laughs> Rob, as I'm sure you already know, is writer and fellow of Emmanuel College, Cambridge. Uh, he is the author of The Old Ways, What a Coincidence, um, <coughs> of Landmarks, of Lost Words and Underland. Simon McBurney is actor, writer, director, co-founder of Complicité. I've discovered to my absolute horror in 1983, which was, of course, five years ago. <laughs> yeah. And between them, they made this wonderful adaptation of... The Dark is Rising, for which I bless them. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's very good, because uh, hearing, hearing you in your correspondence with Philip Pullman, I thought, we were, <laughs> here are the two orangutans um, <laughs> but I, uh, with the, who were entrusted with the Ming vase, but I felt like saying, we, we, we had opposable thumbs, didn't we? Yeah, that we was, did, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We were able to carry the Ming vase and place it <laughs> very gently down on, you did. on this pedestal. Next to your swing. <laughs> <laughs> Next to our swing. <laughs> So what I really want to know is, when did you first read Dark is Rising? Um, Rob, I know you've been a fan for a long time because you have done a Twitter read-along for it very wisely. Yes, I've, I've been a fan for a very long time, uh, since, since 1989, when, as we all know, history ended. Uh, that was the summer that I, that I first read The Dark is Rising and all the other novels in the series, and then I read them again the next year and the next year, and, uh, and here I am at 47. And I think I'm right that I... I you, in, you introduced it to me. I, I hadn't read it before, so I, I, I first read it on the, on the uh, read-along. Um, so that was really the, the... Yeah, that was my introduction. But then you read it aloud. Then I read it aloud to my uh, children. My son is here. We read... Uh, um, I just started to, to, to read them and read them and read them. And, but I read them all aloud. Mm -hmm. And reading them aloud, I suppose, when um, the possibility of doing this came up, my first thought was uh, the way that Susan, her, her voice and um, how the story, how the narrative draws you in is so extraordinary. It's just the most extraordinary piece of storytelling. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, and that, that had to be a part of it. <laughs> <laughs> I really love that you were reading them to your son, um, not least that your son is here, because um, my first encounter with these books when I was too small to read them was having my mum read them to me, and my mum is here. Um, oh, right. I know, right? <laughs> but I think, I think, I think that, uh, uh, I mean, it was so so kind of unfair on my children because I think I was sort of enjoying it more than they were. <laughs> <laughs> I'm and tired, Daddy. Will, Stay up. Please. <laughs> I was getting completely into it. They were fucking fast. <laughs> I've got all, school all, all all I'm going to read another chapter. <laughs> and then I'd have to read the chapter again when they were awake the next night. You know, every, and, children, every author published for children owns an enormous, owes an enormous debt to mums and dads who read, <laughs> read to their children at night. <laughs> well, when you get into a book so much, and you, you, you simply, I mean, the, I really, this is absolutely true. I, 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 I knew that they were falling asleep. In fact, I think they probably knew that they were asleep, but they kept on reading it aloud <laughs> to me in the room. And uh, it was also a pleasure to read it because the, the writing is so extraordinary. It has so many layers in it that it was a fantastic pleasure to read it a second time the next night. Yes. Because you'd find all sorts of things that you hadn't found the, you know, on, on, on the, on the oh, first good. reading. It's really, <laughs> really delicious, delicious writing. Well, at the risk of speaking for your son, um, we haven't given him a microphone, so 
Sorry. Um, <laughs> I can honestly say I, I reread Dark is Rising every year, but I don't always have time to get to the end of the series. So I don't always make it as far as um, Silver on the Tree every year. I should think And that. so when I, hear <laughs> <laughs> when I read that, uh, and when I re read Grey King, I hear my mum's voice doing it. Oh, that's It's like nice. extra time travel yeah. on top of your time travel. It is the most miraculous thing. So parents who read to your children, thank you. You're doing a tremendous job. Um, <laughs> Can I, can I just say one thing about reading aloud? Yes. Which is that speaking aloud is so important in these books. These are books in which to say something into the air is to give it a force that it doesn't necessarily have when it's written down. And, um, and songs are sung that take powerful form when they are sung. Um, and so for us, I mean, so many people know the chant right when mm. the dark comes right <laughs> six shall turn it back three from the circle and three, three from, from the track, track. <laughs> so <laughs> these things go deep and to people making it into sound this is the most wonderful invitation and of course we 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 brought music to it that was made of it Johnny Flynn's here tonight. Which is wonderful music. Yeah. <laughs> and he was part of a group of, of extraordinary musicians who, 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 who revisited those songs, made them new again as, as, as you made them new again. These ancient songs, Adam Lee Bound, and it's almost one of the oldest carols we have, along with the Corpus Christi carol, and carried them across time. So, um, uh, the music yes. was so important to just, yeah. You know. Did you, when you were writing though, you wrote music into these books, deeply into them? Well, it, it's just a part of life and, and part of my consciousness. So I don't, I'm not saying this very well. <laughs> um, yes, there's music is all through them, mm. yeah. So this raises an interesting question, I think, which is that I wondered if you two had approached the book differently, because I have to admit, I assumed that you would have come at it because of the extraordinary landscape descriptions, because that's the kind of writer you are and the kind of person you are. And I assume that Simon would have come at it hearing the sound of it, because that's the kind of performer you are. But it turns <laughs> out that you were both in the music of it all the time. Yeah, and I think, I, I think uh, curiously, it's probably the reverse. It was Rob who was saying, it's the sound. The sound's <laughs> going to be extraordinary. You've got the opportunity of getting the steps in the snow. We don't need the words here. We can just, uh, and it was me going, no, 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 we need the words. We've got to have the <laughs> I think it was, uh, uh, and it was, uh, we tried, I mean, we really went through a process of trying. We went to a remarkable place called... Um, uh, a Hawkwood, which is outside Stroud, Centre for Future Thinking. And we, it's a beautiful, huge sort of Victorian manor with huge trees and vast uh, um, elm tree there as well. Uh, and, we, uh, and you can stay there, and we stayed several nights with actors and so on, and we just tried things out. We didn't, it wasn't, uh, Rob initially, with incredible beauty and generosity, made some some suggestions and made, made some adaptations. But then we took those and we threw them up in the air and then we went back to the books. And so it was really uh, uh, trying to find what I, I was saying before, the, the, what sort of what was propelling Susan underneath everything that she's been saying. About, you found it. About, but about the love for, about the memory of that land and how that, the, the, there's an extraordinary sense of, of I suppose a kind of what you might call almost a, 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 I don't want to use the word nostalgia, but there is a very powerful sense of home, mm -hmm. of where do we come from, what is our root, and which I think is so uh, endemic for all of us. You know, who, who, who the fuck are we? Yeah. Where, what, 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 is, what is rooting us in the ground? And that's the deeply poetic uh, bit of the book. And I suppose we threw that around in 
rehearsal. I mean, we played around with all sorts of things, um, with microphones and, uh, 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 and, and, and uh, um, putting things in different orders and, and, uh, and so on. The wonderful thing was that ha having come to know Susan, as I've been lucky to do over the past five or six years, uh, and having met her in America, uh, I was able to call her up, uh, more or less, and say, Mrs. Stanton's accent. You know. <laughs> <laughs> How do you hear that exactly? So it was like the, the bat phone. Uh, to, <laughs> the, God, the God line was there, was there and available to us. But yeah, no, thank, thank you, Susan, because Susan was such a, such a su supporter and encourager. And I have to tell you how we met. Um, a friend of mine sent me one of uh, Robert's books, um, and in the front she wrote, page 253 is particularly fine. <laughs> of course, I, I turn to this page, and he's, he is writing about The Dark is Rising, saying it's the eeriest book that he's ever met. So I wrote him a thank you letter. <laughs> we got to be buddies. Yeah. Yeah. And so did you know when you met Susan that you were going to try and adapt Dark is oh, Rising. What, no. what was the motivating force? Uh, the motivating force was uh, Simon McBurney, Tim Bell and Compliste, who, who, who brought this wonderful idea in, in um, uh, November 2021. And, um, uh, and, uh, and, and of course, we had to seek Susan's, Susan's blessing. And, um, Which she gave very readily. <laughs> Uh, 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 but I think it was also uh, the circumstances, the, the real circumstances of our lives, which was um, uh, reading, having read it to my children uh, as, a, as a consequence of um, Robert's sort of readathon. Um, during COVID, I, it suddenly occurred to me, I'd really like to read this to more people. I just enjoyed reading it so much. Let's see if I can, <laughs> let's see if we can arrange to do that really quickly. Oh, don't and feel weird. Really, I translated really really Ovid every week for people during And then, of course, <laughs> it, was a, it was a little more uh, uh, complex than that. And so the, um, I think that the idea was, uh, I suddenly thought, well, what if we can actually make something out of this? What if we read? It just began with reading, really. That's, that's where it began. Uh, and then I, I rang Rob, and he just he sort of flew with it. Um, yeah. And how long did the rehearsal process take that you're describing to us? I can't remember. We had several goes at it, didn't we? We had. Well, the, the, whole, pr the whole process took, uh, I guess, I, I began textual adaptation in January, February of, of, of 2022. And, uh, and, and then it sort of went through uh, many, many versions, hugely supported by this great kind of cast of talent at, uh, in terms of production and editing and, um, and then, of course, sound design at the BBC and at, at Complicite. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I guess we, um, we eventually handed our homework in around um, <laughs> December the 19th. It's to be. <laughs> Understood. <laughs> uh, it's a noble tradition. <laughs> I, think, I think the BBC had said, well, you've got, you've got two or three, we'll give you two or three weeks to edit, you know. Uh, two or three months later, we were still only halfway through. Um, that was partly a sense of enormous responsibility to a book that has meant yeah. so much to so many. And we, I mean, I feared the fandom, right? I mean, if you, <laughs> we all know the, the film that, whose name shall not be spoken, um, and, and what that did and the crashing and crushing of dreams that it, that it led to and the thought of, of, of anything other than, um, than honoring uh, a book that has spoken across five decades to millions of hearts and minds across dozens of countries. It was a heavy Ming vase. And, 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 <laughs> and, and, and also, of course, is there's this whole process of compression. Mm. Yeah, because that's the hardest part. Because you say, well, surely, you know, surely we can have 25 minutes. No, 17. Oh, yeah. So you go, it, but it works at 20, 17. No, but what if it's 17? <laughs> you know, you just like, and eventually you're going, okay, I'll cut my thumb off. 
I hope you're happy. I hope you're happy. <laughs> Take that. Would it help if I told you that Radio 4 once made me do the Iliad, all 24 books in 28 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess my question, therefore, is almost already answered, but I do still want to know what was the most difficult part of doing it? What was the most fun part, but what was the most difficult part? I, ha I have to say, I, I will answer that, but I... Just hearing Susan talk is so amazing that I just don't want to use up any more of the airtime. So can I, can I turn that question back on you, Susan, and say you've listened. It must be a strange thing meeting your own characters as, as strangers, as, as, as spoken presences, hearing the room filled with them and the uh, room filled with readers. Hearing the, the, the world's service. Yeah, I, get, I guess It was that. wonderful. Okay. Um. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Back away, monkey. <laughs> Especially after the film, because the only good thing that happened after the film was the number of letters that we got from outraged readers. <laughs> I, I, but I, w I would like to say that there is one picking up on what you were both talking about, and that was the 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 difficulty of the sign of wood mm. and trying to make that work, the complexity of trying to reduce that to say, okay, we're going to go back in time and then we're going to burn a piece of wood and then it's going to come back again in another time going forward. And eventually, um, I think if we... If we, we um, we took the back door out of it. We didn't quite manage to compress it because it's very complex, yeah. beautiful idea. But I think yeah. you get a sense of it in another way. Sometimes we had to say, we understand the gesture behind it, so we're going to have to find another way to produce that gesture yes. and hope that people yeah. will forgive yeah. us. Yeah. That was the bit I actually, that was the only bit, as I was saying to Jonathan, who gave us that wonderful opening to our evening. That was, that was the only bit I actively wrote from new, as it were, was the finding of, of the wooden sign behind a, a panel with a, with, a row, row, with a row and leaf on yes, it. Yes, and it works. Oh, beautifully. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Sorry, did hey. we not say before? That's it. No, no. <laughs> just, that was the only bit that I felt tremendous temerity about. It was just sort of, oh, goodness me, I am actually rewriting Susan Cooper here. Rob, once upon a time, I, had to, uh, I, I spent a period of my life writing screenplays, and I had to write a screenplay from The Dark is Rising, and I reduced the number of signs. <laughs> <laughs> Susan! <laughs> This is how we find out. <laughs> you tell us. Oh, so see. <laughs> All right. That's a that. Total amnesty that's on everything we did. <laughs> <laughs> Just two signs or three? No, no. <laughs> no, five. A short question. Okay. <laughs> this does raise another important question, though, which is: Would you consider doing a stage version? Any of you? No. I mean, it's a thought, isn't it? <laughs> I don't think it would work in the theatre. Well, I, I think, <laughs> I think I, I, but only, only as a... Um, Musical. <laughs> <laughs> so there for opera. <laughs> Biggest laugh of the night. <laughs> Got to hear that laugh. <laughs> oh, nice. Um, <laughs> um, but but I, I, I think, I think is there is a... a um, there is a, 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 a possibility if you were to, to explore such an idea, if you were to start telling the story, in other words, as a storyteller, rather than saying this is a piece of theatre. There's a way in which you can, because that also is theatre. That's uh, true. You know, I mean, I tried, to, I tried to dramatize it for my children by doing, rather ineptly, quite often, all the voices. But the, uh, there is, that is also a form that I, I, I'm very Dramatization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of, uh, where, where you start literally with what is there and you're not trying to pretend to have somebody come in going, I'm Will Stanton, you know, um, mm. which is always, anyway, theatre's a nightmare. 
Um, <laughs> wow, I have terrible news for you about what you do during the day. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, but it, it, it's, it's an, it was an extraordinary experience, wasn't it, Rob, to have all of, I mean, talking of time, the whole year plunged into one book. Um, well, I learned, I learned so much. I learned so much from Susan, and I learned so much from Simon. Um, Simon brought such drama to the... It is already a hugely dramatic book. In fact, one of the gifts of it is that it, it fell into 12 episodes like an apple that had already been sliced and just tapped it and off they came. But there are 13 chapters, I think, which that was the one thing you left us with <laughs> an extra one to absorb. Uh, so that was where we had to compress a bit. But just watching these two kind of... Um, uh, uh, masters of their respective crafts work with with story was was an absolute privilege um, and watching the the transformation the metamorphosis that happens back and forth between between forms um, and each each form of art is only achieves itself it is if it is doing something that another cannot and um, the novel is that absolutely as, as we know uh, and the question for us was how to how to bring sound to it to, to change it in a way that, that the novel isn't which is not to suggest a lack on the part of the novel yes yeah then one last question before I throw it open to the audience um, and uh, audience watching on the live stream, you can send in your questions and uh, they'll be read out in the room. So please do if you'd like to. Um, my last question for the three of you really is, uh, would there perhaps be radio adaptations of the other books in the series? And if not... <laughs> if not, why not? <laughs> I, swear, I swear to you, I've written this down. And if not, why do you hate me? Is how that question <laughs> <laughs> the BBC has plans to do it for television, to do, to do all five... You've heard it here. So whether that would stop us doing it for radio, I don't know. It's literally your book. You can do whatever you like. <laughs> Happy to help. Would you, would you three do another? Is it time for... The Great more? King. Is it time for The Great King? Uh, I, I think The Great King is in, absolutely incredible. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're all incredible. Mm -hmm. Great oh, King shucks. was just... Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, very, very, very... We'll see. We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I hope we can get microphones to you. I feel like um, we should be able to manage it. But if you have a question and you'd like to raise your hand then a roving microphone will rove in your direction and you can ask questions of anyone on the stage unless it is difficult, in which case we might not know the answer. <laughs> so um, if we could come down to here, please, that would be lovely. I feel bad pointing at you. It's a bit accusatory, isn't it? But yes, feel free, roving microphoners, to choose your own person. OK. Um Talking of the Grey King, this is addressed to Susan Cooper. You've talked about your associations with Cornwall and um, Buckinghamshire, but what was it with Wales? Because I, one year, well, ages ago, walked the Cambrian Way, which meant going up Caderidris and from there down to the coast, and it was very evocative of the Grey King. So what was your association with Wales? Uh, the Grey King is my part of Wales, which is um, Aberdovey in mid-Wales, is where my mother's mother was born and where we spent um, holidays often as children. Um, so uh, every inch, just as every inch of the dark is rising is, is the Buckinghamshire that I grew up in, uh, so every inch of the Grey King is, is that piece of Gwyneth um, that, again, that I grew up in. Um, so, yes. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> and could we... Um, sorry, I'm not ignoring you people further back. I'm just trying to minimise the amount of time that the microphone spends moving around the room. But um, I won't miss you, sir. You had a, such an optimistic face then, and then you got... <laughs> it was crushed like an adorable spaniel, but it will... <laughs> well, thanks for that. <laughs> this is a, another question for Susan. 
Why at the end of Silver on the Tree do all the mortal characters forget everything that they've just experienced over the last four books? Oh, children often write and say that. Why did they have to forget? <laughs> Can you imagine what it could possibly have been like for them to live a normal life knowing what they had been through? I don't think so. Um, I, it, it, John Maysfield did a terrible thing at the end of one of his books. He, he, made, he said the whole thing had been a dream. Um, so I didn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I just felt, how could Jane and Simon and Barney live as normal people, having gone through what they'd just gone through. Don't you think that's right? <laughs> uh, we do have a question up at the top. If you can wave when you have a microphone, that makes it easier for us to see you from up here. So do we have a question up there? The mic is already up here. We've got one over here. Oh, awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. This is a question for Susan. Um, Natalie referred earlier to the scene in the church in The Dark is Rising. And I was wondering about the sort of almost syncretic approach to religion you take, where the old ones are quite dismissive of Christianity, but at the same time, Will talks about the church as being a sanctuary. So I was wondering what influenced that kind of idea of faith and religion. I am an agnostic. Um, I think the whole thing is a mystery. Um, I think any church, any mosque, any um, religious building is a kind of sanctuary because it's blessed, if you like, by the faith of the people who worship in it, um, uh, whose faith, for whose faith I have great respect, though I don't share it. Does that answer it? <laughs> and if we could move the mic down, one row we get this lady here, and then after her we could have this man here. Uh, another question for Susan. Thank, thank you so much for these books. They're just so fantastic. Uh, my, my brother, who's in Canada, wanted me to ask this question. He, um, uh, we're, well, we're both big fans of the Lost Land sequence in Silver on the Tree, and just if you had any comments about how that was sort of conceptualized and, and how you wrote it and worked it out, because it's, it's quite different from everything else in the books, I think. It just comes across quite differently. I don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> um, I don't. I'm sorry. <laughs> Your think question about is it. too hard. Sorry. <laughs> write, to me, write to me and I'll think about it. <laughs> um, um, Susan, you wrote the most extraordinary biography of J.P. J. Priestley. Um, and I just wondered if you say a bit about where you think your preoccupation of time coincides with his interest in time. It's something that, that links you both as extraordinary writers, I think. It was one, yes, it was one of the, I met old Priestley, well, how did I meet him? Um, <laughs> oh, I know how I met him. His, his wife, Jaquetta Hawkes, was very active in um, Ban the Bomb. Um, circles, uh, and I wrote a, an op-ed piece in the Sunday Times um, about her, not about her, about it, uh, and Priestley, I got this letter from Priestley saying, that was one of the best pieces I've ever read. Um, <laughs> um, if, if there's any, if there anything I can do for you, let me know. And I thought, well, that's very nice, but, but there isn't. Um, <laughs> and then I wrote... Um, I wrote my first book, um, which was called Mandrake, which was a, a futuristic adult book, um, and got a contract and hadn't a clue, I didn't have an agent, hadn't a clue whether the contract was any good. So um, I said to the literary editor of a newspaper, do you think 
Old Priestley meant that when he wrote to me. <laughs> <laughs> and the literary editor said, if there's one thing about Priestley, it's that he means what he says. <laughs> so I wrote him a note, and, and, and he invited me to tea. And, and then it became a, a friendship uh, with the two of them. She, in fact, had influenced me much more than he ever did because she wrote a wonderful book called A Land. Uh, does anybody know that? Yeah. <laughs> um, which was phenomenal. Um, so the three of us became friends, and after I went to live in America, I would come and stay with them for a weekend every time I came home. Um, he was also rather vain um, <laughs> because... Uh, somebody, a publisher in America, asked me if I would edit uh, Priestley's collected essays, which I did. And I wrote to JB and said, I know so much about you now from um, reading all the essays that I could write a book about you. I could almost write a book about you. And I got, uh, this being the days of cables and telegrams, I got a telegram from Priestley saying, Heinemann offer 500 pounds advance. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I wrote his biography. <laughs> <laughs> he did. We, I mean, we shared this fascination with time. Um, the books of Dunn, D-U-N-N-E, -N -E, um, which try to get into the question of time, he, he was fascinated with, as, as was I. So that, yes, we shared that. Uh, can we keep the mic over this side? Um, so up on this row, and then this lady over here, please. Oh, we're right at the back, sorry. You're too stealthy for me, and also you're behind a really bright light. <laughs> Where did, you, where did you just point them? Oh, uh, to this man here and then to this lady here who's now dropped her hand meanly so you won't find her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's right here. I think it's a he. I can't see from here, I'm afraid. It's a she, but that's okay. Oh, sorry, you're right under the light. My under hair is very hand. short. It's okay. <laughs> um, so I, I think there are a few of us probably in the room at the moment who work in the, the world of children's books and, um, and publishing. And I would love to hear a little bit about um, your journey through publishing these books and finding your publisher and, and your relationship with your editor and what that whole journey was like and that process was like. Um, because I think we all aspire to, at some point, publish a book that still 50 years later <laughs> is as beloved by children as your books are and have had such an enormous impact on people, um, on young people and on older people. Um, so I'd just love to hear a little bit about what that, what that was like, finding your publisher, finding your editor and creating a a relationship that obviously has lasted a very long time and over many books. Is that me? That's you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> she doesn't care about my books, mate. We're all here for you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised you needed me to tell you. Have you got one editor? And I've got two, one for fiction, one for non-fiction. Yeah. I don't have any at the moment. <laughs> the, um, my, I had an editor in America who was an enormous influence and an enormous help. Um, her name is Margaret McElderry. Um, there is now an imprint, uh, which, which is, still exists, um, publishing books in her name. Um, and she, uh, she was at an American publishing house that bought the rights to my first book, over, uh, first book published for children, Over Sea Under Stone. And she... Um, I've just written a piece about her for, a, for an adult book. Um, she wrote... She, she was a legendary editor because she really cared about her authors uh, as people and encouraged them. And um, I had written a book that I thought was an adult novel um, called The Camp, uh, which was pure... Uh, autobiography about growing up in World War II. Um, and I sent it to, I said to Margaret, um, I've published this book and nobody wants to publish. I mean, I've written this book, which nobody wants to publish. Can you tell me what's wrong with it? 
And I sent her the manuscript, and she said, there's nothing wrong with it, but it's, go it's a children's book, and I'm going to publish it. <laughs> so she did. Um, it went through it to, to make me make it a little more available to kids, but it was published as a book called Dawn of Fear. Um, and at the same time, um, I was having the idea for The Dark is Rising and the rest of the books. And I have these letters. Uh, how many have we got, Kate? We've got lots from Margaret uh, saying, I said, I'm writing this rather weird book. Um, uh, it's called The Darkest. I told her about the sequence to be called The Darkest Right. She said, it's a great title. Keep it up. <laughs> uh, and when I sent, sent her The Darkest Rising, which was at first called The Gift of Grammarie, grammarie being the old word for magic, um, Margaret had us change it because she thought it, children might think it was a book about grammar. <laughs> Um, so it became The Darkest Rising, but um, I wrote it very, uh, sent it very nervously, saying this is a strange book. And um, unlike my English publisher, who said this is the longest book we've seen this year, um, she didn't care how long it was. That, that, that sounds stupid today, because books are so much longer. Um, but sh she was a huge influence, um, as an editor can be in publishing, especially for publishing for young people, I think. Um, does that answer the question? And then um, here, please, with your secretly dropped hand, stealthily. Um, unsurprisingly, question for Susan. Um, it's not actually about The Dark is Rising. It's about Seawood, um, which I also loved. Oh, really? I'm really interested in... <laughs> Um, I'm really interested in the idea of kind of the story continuing beyond the final page and the way the reader takes it and spins off in their own imagination and has their own headcanon. But having said that, can I ask in your headcanon, did Callie and West meet again and remember and finish up together? Oh, yes. Hooray! Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Oh, a question from uh, our online viewers, if we may. Can we get a mic down here to the front? Thank you. Sorry, I'm making you run miles tonight. Good exercise. Thank you. We have a question from Jess, who's 14 years old. And she says, as a young fantasy writer, is there any advice you would give me? Keep writing. <laughs> Literally, I mean, don't stop. And write um, for yourself, not for any, any uh, if you're writing, if you think you're writing for children, don't even think about the other children. Just write for what, just say what you want to say. But th the, the basic thing to say to anybody who is writing is don't stop. Mm -hmm. Keep it up. Even you're going, to have, you're going to have terrible bad days when you think it's no good. <laughs> Keep writing. So. While I have the mic, I'm just going to ask another one Please. It's from Jane. And she asks, how did you encounter folklore, myths and legends? And what did you read as a child? That's been so hard to answer because I couldn't give you specifics. Um, I didn't like Grimm and I didn't like Hans Christian Andersen. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> he's so gloomy. I mean, they literally gave you an award with his name on it. <laughs> <laughs> I never got that award. <laughs> I was shortlisted for it. I didn't get it. Is that why you hate him? <laughs> um, I wish I knew the answer, but I don't. Just, just a lot of folk, folk tale, myth. Um, what the books were that I read, I, I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> Can I just add one thought to that? Uh, Susan and I were on the Today programme very briefly this morning, and we had a, I had a really interesting prep call with, the, with an editor who I want to credit with make, helping me realise this, called Eve. And she said something really fascinating has happened, that these books that, that have grown out of folklore have become 
their own form of folklore. And yeah. they are now growing new stories out of themselves. And I just thought, I suddenly thought, I mean, I don't want to make you feel old, Susan. But, uh, <laughs> I'm old. <laughs> but I thought that was a, a wonderful sort of organic cycle that had happened. And that your stories are now, you know, the fan responses to your work have been, has been, is so, is so um, fertile, so generative. Uh, the, green, the green mouth is speaking leaves out of, out of your work as well. This has been happening through the generations, though, don't you think? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yes. which is, it's amazing. Renewal. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Right, um, can we get, yes, up here, and then maybe coming down this aisle, because this brave Spaniel man has not <laughs> had his chance, and we will not leave him. <laughs> um, you don't look at all like a Spaniel. It was just, you had a sort of fallen face briefly, like a tragic Spaniel. <laughs> He's going to come back to you in a minute. Yes, up at the top. I'm not doing a tragic Spaniel face. Um, I just yeah. wondered, uh, to, particularly actually what Robert just said, um, if you read uh, much children's fiction now, and if so, what you enjoy, um, I, I suppose this is to everybody, but particularly to, to Susan, and what you think will still be talked about in 40, 50 years' time. I'm no judge. I'm sorry. I don't, I don't read enough new authors. What do you enjoy? Mostly, for a matter of, mostly because of time. Um, so I can't answer the question, I'm sorry. Can you? Anybody? <laughs> what do your Can kids you? like, Rob? Susan Cooper. Yeah, they're not. <laughs> <laughs> Very hard to... Who do you read? I, I mean, I have... I, uh, you know exactly what I read. I spend all my time reading Homer. <laughs> like a massive nerd. Um, my so, children love Catherine Mandel. I mean, rightly so. Yeah, yeah Golden That's Hall good is answer. lovely. Yeah. But she's really wonderful. Yeah. yeah, well, I think Golden Mole will survive, do we think? Rooftoppers. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah rooftoppers, yeah. Any more for any more? No? Okay, could we come down the aisle? We've got a question here, and then a question here, and then... <laughs> yes, lovely. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, this is a question for all of you, actually. Um, out of the sequence of five books, do you have any particular favourites? Mine's Greenwich. <laughs> Rob. <laughs> oh, I'm just interested in the removal of Greenwich from the... Uh, but. Um, oh, mine is, I think, not mine. Oh, I think yeah. you know, minus Greenwich. No, no. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> maybe I like Greenwich. Yeah. Um, mine is Greenwich. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Happy to clear that equation up for you, baby. <laughs> um, no, no. Um, well, uh, I, I will only say that the... First of all, I just want to say... How incredible to have Susan Cooper here. I just kind of keep doing this sort of, wow. Um, we're just, we're sitting here with Susan Cooper and um, yeah, what, what, a, what a joy it has been I to love hear, you too. You, hear you speak um, this evening and, uh, and, and this afternoon. But I will, I will say that The Darkest Rising has been a book of great power to me and if... Uh, Simon and I were ever to adapt uh, another of the books uh, I think it would, it, for me, it would be The Grey King that, that would follow that. I'm assuming that's a binding contract. Just <laughs> 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 quite, quite a lot of witnesses. Yep. Yep. Simon, what's yours? Um, You're not allowed to choose Darkest Rising because Rob already chose it. I forbid it. Um, <laughs> Let's all assume that Darkest Rising could well be your favourite but. I, I, I mean, each one took me on a completely different journey, but I, at the, um, I too was taken to where, my father was an archaeologist and I used to go to the edge of, uh, the, there was a cave called the, the, the Little Hoyle on the uh, edge of um, Pembrokeshire. Um, um, and so the caves in Wales were something that was very, very close to me from my kind of distant past. So it, it actually spoke to me uh, very much. Um, that, that's why the great, the great king, and mm -hmm. the, particularly um, 
uh, because it had Land Rovers in it. <laughs> <laughs> and my children are fed up because every birthday I say, so have you brought me a Land Rover? <laughs> uh, and they still haven't. Um, <coughs> I used to because drive I one. Because I grew up with Land Rovers. <coughs> um, uh, yeah, there's something uh, absolutely, what I think is so extraordinary in Susan's writing is how things turn as well, mm -hmm. which we haven't necessarily talked about. You're in, you seem to be comfortable in a moment and then suddenly the whole world is going very strange and you start to get, your heart starts to sort of race and, um, it, and, and there's something recognisable in the way that our individual fears are touched upon or perhaps um, excited by these stories, which is not just to do with fantasy at all, but to do with our own shadow selves, mm -hmm. perhaps. Um, and uh, the, 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 they just seem very urgent and very real and the, how opening a gate and going in the Grey King and going in and then seeing this dead sheep, suddenly that's absolutely, um, uh, that, that's a very common experience if you have spent any time in Wales or Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> Wales or Scotland and, and in remote areas, <coughs> at a certain point you'll, you'll come over a little, you know, you'll be, you'll, you'll be in a hill and you'll come over the top and you won't be able to see anybody, but you will see a dead sheep. <laughs> I live in a city, don't tell me this. I think everyone just hugs them until jumpers. <laughs> I try never to write about violence in spite of the dead sheep. Um, I write about... <coughs> Yeah. Very well. I would rather write about fear than about violence. And which is your favourite? Mm. Or do you not have one? Um, asking me which is my favourite book is like saying to a mother, which is your favourite child? <laughs> Only one of your children is here. I assume it's Kate. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that's the best we're going to get. I'm sorry. <laughs> The most we're going to get. Um, I can't what's answer it because it's your too favorite? hard. What's your you know what? I thought I knew the answer. I thought I would obviously say Dark is Rising because it's the Dark is Rising. No, no, no. Of your but books. then also, oh, of mine, whatever. Um, <laughs> but then, I don't know, actually. I don't know what my favourite of mine is. Um, I don't know. Ships cost me more than the others. Um, Pandora fixed me when I was broken. Uh, Stone Blind felt like a a uh, journey I didn't know if I could make, but could. But did. But did. So I don't know. I don't go. know. I can get it down to three. Of yours, <laughs> I think, I don't know. Over, uh, gateway drug book, Dark is Rising book, incredible, you know, Greenwich book. Uh, you know. I, They're different. What, what are we supposed yeah. to do? Care Leon is in Silver on the Tree. Am I supposed to not pick Roman Britain? I can't answer you. Your question is horrible. Never ask it again. <laughs> um, we have time for one last question, ladies and gentlemen. It is your moment. <laughs> Make it count. Have I put too much pressure on you for this question? I feel like maybe I have. No, here, please. <laughs> Don't do the face again. I can't bear it. <laughs> I, I feel really awful because this isn't actually a question for Susan to finish on. It's a question for Robert and, and Simon. But I, I wonder if it might be a question multiple people are wondering. You spoke about the fact that you had to cut down so much wonderful material and that so much material effectively ended up on the cutting room floor and that it felt like cutting your own thumb off. Would there ever be a situation where you would release the, the full um, version with Deleted all of scenes. cut off effectively an extended cut with all of it combined into one as an audio book or similar. The director's cut. Exactly. <laughs> Thumb and all. I can see Simon's eyes lighting up here. I don't know. I don't see the, the eyes, eyes lighting up of my producers and my, my sound designer because... <coughs> We would literally spend a whole day on um, a minute. five minute on a minute, yeah, on five minutes, trying to make it, uh, trying to make it 
work and what do you mean by trying to make it work? It, 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 it's trying to find that experience that you have when you read uh, Susan's books where something happens to you and then you try to find that equivalent thing for you. It, it, I mean, it became very personal uh, when we were doing it and some of the arguments about what, sh not arguments, discussions <laughs> about what should or shouldn't be there were because we all had such a personal response to it. And so when we were making it, Susan was just saying, uh, as the, the advice uh, to uh, the 14-year-old writer who's listening now, you said so beautifully, write for yourself. I think where we got it best was where we made the thing for ourselves. Yeah. We went, ah, yeah. oh, this is what I would like to hear. Mm -hmm. I don't care about you, but this is what <coughs> I, I want to hear. And then, and then perhaps we touched uh, on the truth or something. I don't know. This sounds true to me. Um, when you came on stage, Simon, you said that this um, wasn't a nostalgic experience. It wasn't a nostalgic experience. And I think that's so true in every sense. I was thinking it when you said it, and um, you've just brought me back to it now, that literally, I feel sure, I've said this to Rob 10,000 times already, um, nostalgia means pain for your journey home, right? And, and uh, I think coming back to Darkest Rising for all of us has been the opposite of that. It's pleasure in our journey home, back to ourselves, back to our childhoods, back to our parents reading books to us when we are children, and back to Susan. It has been an absolute privilege, Susan. Thank you so very much. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Susan, thank you.